Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you all so much for coming. So my name is Dr. Helen Coolshed. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am the chair of the Faculty of Natural Mathematical and Engineering Sciences Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And my day job, I'm a senior lecturer in chemistry education. But firstly, uh, happy International Women's Day. So yeah, it's great to see you and, and for people joining us online. It's lovely that so many people are able to be here in whatever way they can be. So I'm first thing to do the mild admin stuff. So if there is a fire, which we're definitely not expecting, and there's no chemistry happening in this building, so hopefully it can't be our fault. Um, so you just go out the door that you came in, round to the right, and then we get to enjoy the nice um, rainy, sleety weather there, and they're definitely um, cool off there. So hopefully that's not going to happen, but just in case, please do that. Um, if you need the bathroom, if you go through either of these doors, in the middle there's um, bathrooms there. So please do do that if you need to. Um, you probably have seen the signs, but we are recording it, so we've got people joining us online, um, but it will also be recorded. So should you want to watch it again or share it with other people, that will be possible. Um, and yeah, there'll be photographs being taken, things like that. But if you don't want to be included, then please do just let us know and we'll aim to avoid you. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for being here. So the great thing about being EDI lead is that I get to see a lot of the things that are happening across our faculty. So one of the things that we're working on is our Athena Swan. We know that that's predominantly focused on gender equality. And one of the things that um, I've made a priority for our faculty is race equality. And I think one of the things that we have seen is that by having this work be siloed, often it means that we're not taking an interdisciplinary approach to things, an intersectional approach to things. So that's something that I'd really like to see us do moving forward, is rather than saying we either care about gender this week and race the next, that we try and look at the whole person and think about everything from gender, race, disability, and be much more intersectional in how we support our students and staff. So the other thing that I would say is something that hopefully we can talk about a bit more later is like what motivates people to work um, in this space and hopefully make it better. So some of the things that we've seen happen is the government deciding to cut the ties between um, kind of medical funding and Athena Swans, and that being um, quite critical in terms of disincentivizing people doing this work, so really critically looking at the data that's being generated. Um, but I think for me, events like this are really important so that we can speak to each other, have a look at the data, so um, our fantastic speaker will be giving us quite a, I guess an honest uh, lens on, on what data looks like, particularly in the UK, but sort of making a decision about what that means for us moving forward and what change and what priorities we'd like to see happen moving forward at least in the King's context, but obviously more widely, how we can influence things um, for the better. But anyway, enough about me and what I think. I'm going to hand over to um, our uh, Bipin, so from, who's come from engineering, and they're going to introduce um, Rachel Beer. I hope you have a lovely time, and I'll speak to you later. Thank you, Helen, and happy International Women's Day to everybody. So it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Rachel Oliver, who is visiting us from the University of Cambridge. She's a path-breaking scientist in the field of gallium nitride materials, physics, and technology. She specializes on you know, optimizing these materials that are used for anything from blue LEDs to other lighting materials and you know, all kinds of really cool applications. But in addition to all that, she has also done some really eye-opening work around um, equity and funding and other aspects in the UK higher education sector, which I think is equally or more important that we hear and understand and see what we can do to address these uh, systemic inequalities that we have in our system. Um, Rachel is a fellow of the Institute for Materials, Minerals, and Mining, and a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. A really uh, accomplished, distinguished speaker for us today. Rachel, all yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Hi, I'm Rachel. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about more about me in a second. Um, and today, I'm primarily going to talk about funding for research and who gets that money. Okay? And I'm going to talk a little bit about why those are questions that I came to ask and what I found out by asking those sorts of questions. Um, so 
I've already been introduced beautifully, but I have this lovely Venn diagram that is me, because I guess people talk about me quite a lot as a scientist. So yeah, gallium nitride is my material. It's what you use to make the blue LED, which is inside any um, energy efficient LED light bulbs you may have at home is a blue LED made of the material that I'm interested in, and that's part of me. Another part of me is that I'm a founder of a spin-out company, again, exploiting these nitride materials. But also, and an equally important part of me, and something that maybe people don't talk about, is I am a mum. This is my son, Jamie, um, with a bike that he had borrowed and was very, very pleased about. So that's a huge part of my life as well. And as um, Bipin mentioned, a big part of my life in the last few years has been talking about equity and equality in the sciences, talking about particularly these questions around how we fund research on what's fair and what isn't. So this is one of the things I've done in that space, talking to the Science and Technology Committee at the House of Commons about these kinds of questions. Um, and I guess there's probably loads of other circles I could add as a part of who I am into that. But I think it's quite important to kind of bring our full selves to these sorts of discussions. Um, so that's a little bit of me. But there's also been a whole load of other people who've really helped me develop some of the analyses you see, see here today or influence the way that I think about them, the way I talk about them. So I'm not going to go through everyone's names, but some amazing women from across the UK have been involved in this. There's a group called the Inclusion Group for Equity in Research in STEM, or TIGERS, which I have to say is quite quiet at the moment, but over the past few years, we as TIGERS put together a lot of the stuff you're about to see in terms of data analysis. Okay, and I'm gonna talk about funding. So the question is, why am I talking about research funding as a thing I care about hugely on International Women's Day? And well, I am a research scientist, okay? So I care a great deal about scientific research. I think it's fascinating, I think it's fun, and I think it's important for the future of the planet. But to do that, you need cash. You need to be able to buy the equipment with which you do your science. You need to be able to buy the chemicals, the consumables. You also, in many cases, like I these days, my salary is paid by the university, but I need to raise my people's salaries. Often, research funding applications is about raising your own salary. It's about raising the money that lets you stay as a scientific researcher. It's not our kind of pretty picture of the ivory tower where we all think deep thoughts and explore the purity of knowledge, but money is what makes the research world go round, and it's most acute in the sciences where we really do need equipment, chemicals, all these things. So this research funding, these research grants, are what defines who gets to do research. And that's really the question that interests me. Why should you care about this? Well, I suspect that most of this audience, I hope, I'm being positive, would agree with me that we care about this because it's, at base, a question of fairness. Yeah? That the research, the money that pays people to do research, that allows us to do research, should be being distributed in an equitable manner because that's what is fair. But let's just pretend we don't care about fairness. Let's pretend we care about things like science and the economy and you know, raising innovation capital and all this great stuff. We still need to care about the fairness of the distribution of funding. And that's because there's been some quite big studies which suggest that people who are in minoritized groups, whether that's women in the physical sciences or people of color more broadly across academia, those people are often very, very innovative a study of about a million PhD theses in the US using AI to pick out markers of innovation showed that actually those minoritized folk innovate more than their majority demographic counterparts, but they get less recognition for it. So basically what we're doing, if we're underfunding and not raising up our minoritized people, is we're taking really good ideas out of the ecosystem and letting them die, which doesn't strike me as a good way to run a successful economy. So it's about fairness, but it's also about doing a better job of our science and engineering. Whoops, that went backwards. I want to go forwards. OK, so I have in my kind of set of view graphs many, many slides of data. But I always focus on this one. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that, but partly because it really expresses my journey personally into asking questions about this. What this graph gives us, okay, oh, I mustn't wander. 
I'm going to wave. On the y-axis, we have the award rate, which is, like, if you apply for a grant, how likely are, is that grant to be awarded to you? Okay? And on the x-axis, we have the value of that grant, starting from about 500,000 nearer to me and going up to about 10 million pounds on the other side. And your orange and yellow lines are award rates for men, and your greenish lines are award rates for women. Okay? And what you will hopefully notice is if we're talking at the low money end of that grant, the small grants, men and women are pretty much equally likely to be awarded those grants. And it's like a pair of scissors. It diverges, and at the far end of that graph, men are about two and a half times more likely to get a big grant that they apply for than women. Okay? Now, firstly, I think that's a pretty shocking statistic, because what that's basically saying is the big projects, the major leadership, the being the kind of key top leaders in your field, that's going to men in a hugely disproportionate way. Okay? Um, but the second thing about this graph is that I spent a very, very long time asking for this data. I first started asking questions about not like what is the aggregate award rate, but how does award rate vary with size of grant in ooh, about 2012, I think. It took me seven years of asking to get at this data. Okay? And my story as somebody who became essentially an activist in this space is essentially the story of a quest for that graph because nobody would tell me the answer to a simple question. Oops, did you keep pressing the wrong button? Why did I ask the question in the first place? Well, I went to a meeting which was a program grant leaders meeting. Program grants, for those of you who are happy enough not to know, are large grants from the EPSRC, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. They're sort of five million pounds plus, typically big five-year investments to do like major strategic projects. Okay? Now, I went to that meeting not as a program grant leader. The person who was my boss at the time wanted to take me along essentially as a sidekick and with some difficulty got permission for me to go. Okay? So I went to this meeting to kind of find out about this ecosystem of program grants and all the program grants that existed at the time, which was about 100 program grants, were represented. And it was very quickly very evident to me that there were very few women in the room. In fact, in terms of scientists, rather than people from the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council who administer research, there were three women in the room. And one of the others was like me. They were a sidekick. Okay? So out of 100 grants represented, there was one female program grant leader. Okay? One out of 100. And I asked what I felt was a simple question. You've only got one female leader here. Is that because women don't apply for these grants? Or is that because women apply and you don't award them these grants? And I thought they'd just have the data at their fingertips and would tell me. And nobody knew, and they flanneled at me. Um, and I kept asking more and worse and louder for years. And eventually, I essentially asked a parliamentary committee who asked the EPSRC, and some time after that, we got to the graph I showed you. Um, and there's more to it than that graph, which we will come to. Oh, I really need to go, learn to go forward. I'm going to talk, though, a little bit more about that journey. Because at the beginning of that period for asking of that data, I was, I guess, probably lecturer, not even reader. Okay? So I was a pretty junior academic. I was Dr. Rachel Oliver. And I was not very comfortable keeping asking these questions, okay? I was probably also not very safe. I was a fairly junior academic, busy winding up my funder about questions about whether they were being fair about how they distributed funding. I didn't feel that that was gonna help forward my career in science, yeah? Um, I was probably safer than I was comfortable, to be honest, but it wasn't a great thing to be doing. Actually, it worked out fine for me, so maybe I was safer than I thought, I don't know. So this is me now. I have put like, all my letters after my name. It's more than my name, my letters after my name these days. Um, and I'm feeling a lot more comfortable, stood on my platform as professor, having these conversations with some very senior people. And I'm also a whole lot safer, 
I suspect. I don't think anyone's going to sack me at this point for asking these questions or refuse to fund my research. Um, I think that's worth saying because for those of us who have a platform, we need to be the ones speaking up and raising our loud voices and facing up to these sorts of problems because it isn't fair to ask the people who are less safe to do so, who might be losing jobs and losing opportunities by doing so. Um, so I invented this dude. He doesn't exist. Professor Straight Whiteman, FRN, Jeff RS. Um, sir, yeah, knight of the realm, very important chap. Somewhere there is a tiny green circle, which is how comfortable he feels talking about this. Very, very uncomfortable, perhaps. But his zone of safety extends somewhere out into space. Yeah, No one is going to take him to task for this. In fact, he'll probably get a lot of kudos for doing this. I am not talking to very many, many men in this room. Hi, Bithin. <laughs> um, but if you are Professor Sir Straight, Straight White Man, FRN, Jeff RS, this is your job. It's not actually mine, even. Okay? Um, however, since he doesn't exist, I made him up. He's not going to step up. So we'll talk about some things that I've been involved in for now. Well, go forwards, go forwards. Okay. So before I started bothering the EPSRC about the data sets they should be releasing, this is what the sort of data they were willing to release look like. Okay? There's a small number of people who don't disclose their gender. They are in grey on the graph. Blue otherwise is men. Red is women. How likely you are to get your grant against time. Okay? And what you'll see is that actually it looks like mostly there are equal award rates between men and women. Everything looks fine. But that isn't how it looked to me on the ground, meeting a room full of 100 leaders with one woman in. And then if you look at the size of the awards, you start to see that the situation isn't as simple as that. Because yes, women are just as likely to get their grant. But every year, the average woman, average grant received by a woman is smaller, often much smaller, than the average grant received by a man. Recently, though, we've been able to get at the amounts of money that are requested by women. And it turns out they are also much smaller than the amounts of money requested by men. And I think a lot of people might stop asking questions here and say, well, you know, it's all women's fault. You just need to kind of put on your big girl pants and decide to apply for bigger grants, and then that will solve the problem. So women don't ask, and therefore they don't get, yeah, who knew, not much of an issue. That is what we call a deficit model. Okay? Deficit models say that where a minoritized group is underachieving, not winning big grants, not um, getting promotions, it's because those minoritized people are doing stuff wrong. Okay? They ought to be doing something else. But is that really the case? If we want to think outside that box, we have to say, well, if women are only applying for smaller grants than men, why is that? Are there things about our system which prevent or discourage women from applying for larger amounts of money? Now, I could frankly talk about this all day and probably into tomorrow, and I do have a time limit, so don't let me. Um, the sort of scholarly version of the research we did into this is in this paper called A Review of Barriers Faced in research funding process in the UK. Um, and I'd really recommend it. Helen will tell you there is also a more kind of barn stomping version, which is in Nature Chemistry. But th this is where we kind of get into all the literature and data and show that we really mean it, that there's evidence that a lot of barriers exist. But I'm going to come back to that graph and talk about this graph, which took me forever to get, in the context of those questions I'm asking about what are the barriers that prevent people from applying. Now, before I get into that, I want you to remember what the graph is actually showing. It's showing a ward rate. So this is the people who did apply, losing out, at the largest grant end, about a two and a half times rate. To be quite frank, that's a barrier in and of itself, because that means you see very, very few women holding these big grants and a lot of men, and it's difficult to imagine yourself in that space. And also, if it looks like the system's biased against you, you might go and do something else, frankly. As somebody who has to make decisions as to whether to apply into these schemes, it's pretty damn off-putting to me. So quite apart from that, though, what are the barriers? Well, this 
is an EPSRC chart of the processes we use to apply for these large grants. Do not worry about any of the detail. The only thing I want you to take away, really, is this is a profoundly multi-step process. You have to do a lot of things, okay? And there are multiple points in this multi-step process where you can be lost from the system, whereby if you don't do this thing well enough, you don't pass to the next stage, okay? I also want to say there's a step missing. I've got an extra turquoise box here which says university triage, okay? The reason that's there is because this is the EPSRC's process, but nobody is going forward to apply for a £5 million grant without their university's approval. In some places, that approval process is straightforwardly competitive. At some in some places, those decisions are made in a actually less transparent fa fashion, and in some places, they may say, yes, everyone can go forward, but you need a very supportive university letter to get over these many hurdles that these boxes represent. And you can be allowed to apply, but not get the same kind of support a male colleague might get, okay? So that's the first thing, that there are a lot of small hurdles. The second thing is that we've got all these application stages, but everything in my red box is outside of the data that I eventually, after seven years of asking, extracted from the EPSRC because they don't start counting your application as existing until you've got out of the red box and into the stage of the process that's right at that end of the view graph, okay? So, firstly, if there's any bias at all in decision-making processes, multi-stage processes give it an opportunity to accumulate through the process. So, a small differential between men and women can turn out to be a large difference in the number of men and women succeeding at the end of that process. But secondly, if the question is, do women apply for large amounts of money, the answer is, God knows. Because we don't know who applied within that red box, okay, and got chucked out of the street. Okay. But what we have here is a pipeline. And I know people don't like the leaky pipeline metaphor for lots of reasons, but this is basically a really straightforward pipeline. It's linear, there aren't kind of multiple branches, and different opportunities you could take. You get in one end, you try and get to the other. And people could be leaking at every stage, but we're not monitoring them and we're not asking why we're losing them out of the system at every stage. So if we started out with saying, oh well, women don't apply for large grants, you don't ask and you don't get, I think actually, to me, the picture looks like we get denied the opportunity to ask because institutional triage processes prevent us from asking, and then they tell us off for not asking, which doesn't look fair to me at all. Okay, so what we have is a lower award rate for large grants for women than for men, okay? And there's a lot of things come into that. Overall, we have to admit that some of these decisions are made by people who have sexist attitudes, and that will be affecting whether people get their grants. We know, and this is probably when you talk about these things with female academics, probably the thing that comes up most often is this question of how institutions gatekeep our opportunities, okay? Even if our academic staff are not deliberately gatekeeping our opportunities, the other thing we hear is that people get less administrative help if they are women or otherwise minoritized. So all of these things are causing that low funding award rate. But the funding, the low award rate in itself then has other implications. Because if I don't win the big grant, I can't do the big project, it's kind of obvious, okay? At which point, my brilliant ideas are not seeing the light of day, I'm not writing the fancy papers, I'm not boosting my track record. When I next apply, my male colleague who did get the big grant, he's a whole step ahead of me. He's got a much better track record, he's much more likely to get the grant. Also, I didn't get the grant. So, you know, as far as the university is concerned, I'm not busy. So they can allocate my time to other things, like more teaching and more admin. I'm less engaged in my research community. I'm less able to develop my next proposal. As soon as you start to have these inequities, they form cycles, and they, they are the cause of even lower rates of success by our minoritized folk. Okay, 
so I've been talking a lot about the data, and I'm very pleased we've got the data, but the real question is what are we going to do about it? And I'm not going to try and come up with a simple set of solutions for you today, I'm afraid. What I'm going to try and do is briefly outline some of the characteristics of what I see as good solutions. So what does effective action in this space look like? And this applies to funding questions, but it also applies to quite a lot of other questions we might be asking about improving the representation of minoritized people in the sciences. Firstly, a good solution addresses the data. It actually looks at what the problem really is. It doesn't hide behind an aggregate number where, because women get lots of small grants, it looks like women are doing just as well as men. But it also addresses the lived experiences behind the data. I tend to think in a very like physical sciences and engineering frame. The thing I've learned through talking to many colleagues about these issues is that we really need our social science colleagues to come and help us understand why these things are happening. And we address why people are falling out of these pipelines, what's going wrong for them, because it can be subtle and difficult to address these problems. We need to worry about intersections, because all the data I've shown you so far has been about women. Okay? We haven't asked ourselves, well, how does a black woman fare in this process? How does a disabled woman fare in this process? And we really need to, and I'm going to come back to that. When we think we're making solutions, we also need those solutions to be co-created. We do not need solutions which are imposed from on high on us, because often those solutions don't work. We need to engage the communities who are meeting these barriers in how we dismantle them so that we do it in a way that is actually helpful. We need to actually remove the barriers. Okay? We don't need uh, useful training courses for women on how to be more confident in writing large grant proposals, because if they then are confident to write a large grant proposal and their institution still says, nah, we'll let Professor Straight White Man put his in and not you, we haven't done anything useful at all. Now, I don't know how many of you have met SMART as an acronym for managing projects. Um, it stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Relevant, and Timed, or Time Limited. It's an approach we take to monitoring engineering projects to figure out whether we're actually you know, going to get our bridge built on time. Yeah? It's nice and concrete. It's very tedious to apply. I don't like having to write SMART goals, but I would like EDI goals, quality goals, to be SMART. I would like to be able to tell whether we've met them, and I would like to have a time by which we should have met them, rather than just going, oh, well, things should be better in the future. Yeah? It needs to be specific. We need to know whether we're getting somewhere, and we need to hold ourselves to account to get it done in some finite time. That, for me, often involves incentives. Okay? So um, Helen was mentioning Athena Swan. For a while, health research funding was tied to having an Athena Swan Award. And mysteriously, the number of women PIs went up enormously, okay? Because you couldn't have the damn money unless you'd thought about equality for women in your department. Now, that's a scheme that has been removed by the government. We're not allowed to do that anymore. But it was very noticeably having an effect because it struck universities where they care, in the wallet, that if you didn't deal with these issues, you actually lost money. So we need carrots and sticks. And last of all, we need to not be mar marking our own homework on this. We need to allow scrutiny of our processes, and we need to be transparent about what we are and aren't achieving. OK. There is a longer version of this, which is Rachel's 12-point plan for action. This is my 8-point plan. It was shorter. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to talk a little tiny bit more about I finish about this question of intersectionality. Because really, I've been talking about the impact of sexism on research funding. Amongst other things, we really need to name the impact of racism on research funding as well. And this is where the data gets quite stark and quite shocking, at least to me. So this is EPSSC award rate data broken down by race. Okay? If you, don't worry, I'll read the key bits, I promise. If you are white, there is about a 30-ish, 28 plus or minus something percent chance that you will be awarded your grant if you make an application. If you are black, there is a 16% chance you will be awarded your grant if you make an application. And basically, 
all the other ethnicities that are specified, again, are significantly lower than the white award rate. Now, that differential between white and black researchers, I think, is shameful. I think we, as a community, should be ashamed of ourselves. Okay? And it's worse if you get into absolute numbers. Okay? And I think it's worth sometimes talking in absolute numbers, because this is like how many senior black scientists there are in the UK getting grants who can stand as role models for our younger black community. In, this is 2017-18 and 2018-19, in each year, the UKRI, so this is the whole overarching um, UK funding body, not just engineering and stuff, they awarded about 2,000 grants a year. And in each of those years, 10 grants went to black leaders. So, you know, I need the fingers of my two hands. I do not need to take my shoes off to count these people. I mean, that's obscene, okay? So that's just if we just think race. But let's come back to our intersection. How many black women are there in the fingers of my two hands? And the answer is, I can't tell you. Because those numbers are so small, the EPSRC or UKI redact the data because they are too small, yeah? Because you would be able to identify individuals from them. And within the kind of privacy laws, we can't publish data that looks like that. At that point, just the fact that there's so few people, so few individuals, is the story in and of itself. It's not actually a surprising story. Um, a lady called Dr. Ruby Seltzer keeps a log, essentially, of every woman, every black woman, who becomes a professor in the UK. Her data, I think, is ahead of the official statistics. So she has in her log the best data we have on how many black women professors there are in this country, full professors. And her current number stands at 56. Out of, I've got it written down somewhere, 23,495 professors, 56. Now, when the data I showed you from 2018-2019 were like live, when we were in 2018-2019, that number stood at 25. So what we are talking about is that at this intersection between being a woman in the sciences and being black in the sciences, the level of discrimination and lack of support really, really bites. Okay? I've talked about gender and a little bit about race, and I'm no longer really willing to stand up in front of these talks and talk about just the problems that women face, because frankly, what little we've done about in this country has benefited women like me. Yeah? I'm middle class and white, I'm in a good space. Yeah? But we've not really talked about disability, we've not really talked about um, the barriers faced by LGBTQ folks, difficulties around age, and the effects of socioeconomic class. There's a whole broad spectrum of other forms of identity that are affecting people's success in this space as well. Um, and some of it is to some extent addressed in the available data, some of it like socioeconomic class, and to be honest, LGBTQ is pretty much ignored. So there's a huge amount of work still to be done just to find out where we're falling short. Okay, but I'm gonna come back to finish to these cycles. So the reason I care about funding, and I said it at the beginning, is it what makes the world of research go around. If you take funding away, you take away opportunity, you take away time, you put people in a place where they can't climb career ladders, you put people in a place where they then don't become role models, and it all accumulates, it all becomes cyclical. So what we're trying to do, and I hope everyone here will agree with me that it needs doing and there's still a lot of work to be done, is to break those cycles. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sure everyone really enjoyed that. So we're going to now move to the panel event. So I know I can see Funmi, I think, and Lorraine, do you want to come up, as well as our student leaders? So if you can come to the front, say, so. thank you. I've been told if you can not lean back on the chairs so that you can speak into the microphones, that would be magical. Thank you.
So I guess for this part, what we're going to do is um, I'd like to hear from everybody if possible and hear, do you have to pick everything? Obviously, Rachel covered quite a lot of areas, but if you can pick one thing that you're working on that starts to address some of these things or one thing that you that really resonated with the talk that you think um, you're working on or, or your society is working on, that would be great to hear. So your name, your pronoun, and I guess you know what society or what you're representing, and then one thing that you're working on or resonated with you be magic. So yeah. Then maybe like to start. Thank Good. you. Hi everyone. Hello. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> First and foremost, I'm Fumi Olonishaki. I'm professor of security leadership and development at the African Leadership Center at the School of Global Affairs at King's. But I also happen to be the vice president responsible for international engagement and service at this moment in time. And I also happen to chair Race Equality uh, Leadership Action Group, uh, which we set up prior to the submission of our Race Equality uh, Charter Mark uh, application. I was struck by Rachel's presentation. I was completely blown away uh, to see this white woman's STEM academic uh, making actually part of the cause, one of the causes of her time, this question. And the data that you have shown helps us explain a lot. And actually her point about, her question about what are we doing about this, I think is what I want to make two comments on. Number one, it's true, I'm one of those uh, 56 now. It's good to see that it's 56. At some point it was 40 and then going back, but it's because some retire, some leave academia, but that it's standing as 56 is positive because this is against all odds. And therefore, the question, the, 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 the thing that keeps me awake at night, notwithstanding that we have the African Leadership Center and that some of our PhD students are also black Caribbean, different parts, they come from dif different parts of the world, different parts of the UK, is how do you find more black women professors, let alone professors in STEM, if you look behind you and there's no one coming behind, right? And I now have seen examples in the last five years of about six black women who have left academia. Not just at King's, in, in the top Russell Group universities because of some of these questions of just feeling that they can't you know, they can't cross that, they can't pass that mark, they can't cross that line. How do we build a pipeline that works? Where should this be located? How should we locate it and so on? And I don't think it's one person's job. And the point I always make, Rachel, and I think you alluded to that, is it shouldn't be up to only the black woman in the room uh, to do these things, but thankfully I have to say that in senior leadership, I have a couple of senior sponsors of this issue, the work that Lorraine and her team are doing, but it requires actually concerted action within universities. It requires devotion to the recruitment pipeline in the first instance, because our data at King's, you know, they're very clear about where these top marks are. Uh, when people come uh, to apply, you have many more, at some point, you know, they fritter away and then the, 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 the data, the statistics look different when you offer those positions. So finding the next step to developing a pipeline that doesn't leak is part of our mission mm -hmm. through this. So in a sense, Athena Swan and Race Equality, Chattermark, speak to each other, but that intersectionality is the main issue there. You cannot deal with my blackness today and then wait to deal with my being a woman tomorrow or being, uh, you know, from the social, from the lower social economic, you know, classes to, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. That is one thing. My last point, though, is how do we build some of these strategies into the consciousness of our colleagues across the board? Because if we don't build this into the consciousness, you were talking about the triage, I recognize it. Across the board, it's not just about STEM. 
I recognize it the number of times you put an application in and somehow you haven't been told exactly why it didn't make it through and the other one made it through, right? This is no longer my problem because when you get to that place, what did you, what did you say? Your power or your safety expands. I'm now in a place of safety relative to others behind me. But it is something we need to you know, build into the recruitment process, the research uh, selection process, the peer review process across the board. So it requires something. And that is something I don't think we have done yet, uh, even at King's. I'm going to stop at that, but it, it's a work in progress. It's a lot of work uh, to be done still. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're absolutely speaking my language in terms of <laughs> recruitment. It's, I think, fundamental to how we, we make things better and, and that, have that change. I think it's timely then to, to ask Lorraine to, to comment as well. Thank you. Thank you, and completely agree with everything you say. So, um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for the invitation today. My name's Lorraine Kelly, and I'm Director of Organisational Development and Equality, Diversity and Inclusion here at um, King's. And it's a huge privilege to, to have a role and a, and a job like this. My team um, lead the pieces of work around Athena Swan, which is our Gender Equality Inclusion Plan, and also the Race Equality Charter Mark. Um, and these plans are really important because they start to look at some of the systemic issues that we're talking about here. They start to do that piece around collecting data um, and ensuring that we're not mocking our own homework, as you were saying, you know, that we've got some external eyes that are saying, okay, this is great, but you know, let's dig into this a bit more. What are you looking at over here? I think these pieces are, are enormous, aren't they? They're really big and they impact every single one of us. And I think um, I stepped into the EDI role back in May. And all I've been saying to everybody that I meet, you know, at all levels, is this is every single one of us is accountable for this. You know, it's great that we have this team, absolutely, but every single one of us has to be accountable for building inclusion in the way that we work, in the way that we interact, in our understanding of it. We need to think about how we join this up right from the moment that somebody even thinks about King's College London, you know, let alone when they step through our doors. Um, and I really feel like one of the things that struck me when you said you know what's made a difference when you think about um, your background personally for me but also when I think about this ED and I work that I've done it's been mentoring it's been networks it's been building that safety and that comfort zone and actually it's really hard to do that if you feel like you're on your own so if you can build and this is a network here this is a network of, of brilliant people and colleagues that can support each other and actually having those honest conversations really thinking about what's been your experience how can we support each other exactly to your point we've got a responsibility to bring people up around us the whole way even if we don't feel like we've got a lot of power we have we have got the opportunity to do that and the more of us that do that i really feel like we start to see that change we start to see see the difference but it's enormous work and we've got to keep tapping, you know, chipping away. But I feel like the more of us that do that, the, the quicker it will be. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. And I guess just so people think, start thinking about questions and similarly people online thinking about questions, so we're gonna to move to an open question session just afterwards. Do you want to introduce yourself and say what spoke to you? Yeah, sure. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Alex. I'm the Chair and VP of Women in STEM, Women in STEM Society. Um, it's very nice to be here today speaking to you all and listening to your presentation. I think it's really refreshing to hear um, someone talk about courage and women's courage um, where it's not in the discourse of empowerment and um, shifting the responsibility onto us to apply for these grants. It's just because we're not applying or it's just because we don't have the courage to apply for grants as big as men. Or even, you know, when I'm at work and I'm writing an email, they're like, oh, take your exclamation points out, write like a man and you're more likely to get a response. I think that notion of courage shifts the responsibility onto completely the women. And we know what the problem is. We, you know, we have our own echo chambers, we know that gender inequality exists. We face it every day. Whenever we're applying to anything in the workspace, in uni, um, it's everywhere around us. And I think we, um, that notion of accountability is something that's also really important to discuss, um, to hold people accountable, to also start this discourse with men. Um, it's really refreshing to see like so many diverse people in the audience today, and that doesn't only mean women. It's really good to see kind of men in the audience today as well because most of the time when I'm at these sessions, I'm just, it's like staring back into a mirror. Like, we all know these issues, and I think it's about time we 
start inviting kind of men to speak up for us as well and um, hold people accountable, um, call their friends out as well and to get these issues into their heads and not to be ignored so that the responsibility is again shifted off us and onto our male counterparts as well because it's time for them to do something too. Magical, I think we can all get behind allyship um, and <laughs> activism, so yeah, thank you so much. Uh, hi, my name is Charlie. I am the president of Women in Computer Science and I am also a student member of the EDI committee here at King's. Um, I, what really resonated was especially what you said about uh, intersectionality. Um, personally, I've been affected and I know a lot of people in our course, for example, have been affected by kind of viewing gender as the only really limiting factor in STEM. It's, oh, you're a woman in STEM, but you don't consider how it is to be a person of color, how it is to be LGBT, how it is to have a learning or physical disability. And I think that's something that we all have to consider, but is not something that we should put on, res as, as everyone before me has said, this is not a responsibility that should be put exclusively on people who are affected by this. And that is something that you also see at a lot of tech events. I'm also the actually the only female ex member of the executive committee in KCL Tech. And you find that in a lot of the events, it's, ex it's almost exclusively men who show up to these events. But for the second they have a women in STEM panel, suddenly the entire audience is all women. <laughs> and even when you even if you try and have this little snapshot of, oh, we're being diverse, it's about women now. Even then, so from what we've seen at, for example, the Tech Summit, all of the speakers were white women. Um, there's so much more than just gender that needs to be looked at. And, there's, and while we cannot be held fully responsible for this, I think it's something that we all have to be very, very much aware of, especially since I think a lot of these women in societies are fairly new. They've only been started fairly recently. Women in computer science is only in its second year of existence, which means even now when we do collaborative events, we get very low turnout from both men and women because men feel, men frankly feel very uncomfortable coming into these spaces. They feel like, oh, this is a event targeted towards women. I don't need to be here. I don't need to. Um, I don't need to think about these sort of issues, but they do, they do. It's, as, as you've said about it being an echo chamber, anyone who's in this room, anyone who's in this panel is already aware of this being an issue. And unless there's a means of getting that to people who frankly don't care or would be affected by this in a way that may not be entirely beneficial to themselves, there's not much that as individuals, I believe we can do. It has to be a structural change. So yeah, I'm someone that can help with structural change, particularly in our <laughs> faculty, so I'd be excited to hear what that might look like. Um, hi everyone, my name is Priyanka. I'm the president of the Women in Physics Society here at King's. Um, I, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I want to thank you for your talk because we were actually having a conversation about this before and how we were saying that as much as we do, we do as women, there's, again, I'm just going to repeat what you said because there's only so much we can do and so much impact we can make because at the end of the day, it does come under structural changes and people at the head of the department. And I, we're very fortunate that the head of our department is um, Ruth Gregory uh, of the physics department, but I can't say that for all STEM departments. I think we are doing our very best to try to make a change and it does come under the impression that women are the ones making the change. and we can't do it alone and that's kind of the message that our societies are sending out that our every inclusion and di uh, diversity department is trying to send out that everyone needs to be involved in this progress that we're trying to make and I get this question a lot from men that again like you said that oh but this is, this is a women society we can't come and our point is that you should be there to help champion women and that's the point of our society is to try to spread the message that everyone should try to help champion women because we've been underrepresented for so long and it's just it's if you want to make things equal then you 
you, you can't have half the people do, doing the job. And the thing with men is as well that you've got women who go into into PhDs and doing their doing things and they've always got some kind of thing holding them back, such as maybe they want to start a family and that's got to, they've got to take time off of that and you've got this thing of uh, where people in the, who are looking at your applications are saying, oh, this person's worked five years. Um, we all talked about this, the way someone's working, you're, we're going to look at your research that you've done for five years and then look at someone else who's done for five years. You're not taking into account that some of the problems that the minorities are facing or the people who are underrepresented are facing compared to the people who are making those 2.5 times more success rate. So I think it is, everyone's got to look at this problem and everyone has to work together and it cannot just be put on women or on just our women's societies. Um, but it is, again, like you said, it's really great to see such a diverse mix of people here today and hopefully we can use things like this to highlight the issue and just make it well known across the whole university and maybe across the country if we can. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> Meg, <don't get> it. <laughs> so hi everyone, um, I'm Megan and I'm a PhD student over at the Roger Williams Institute of Hepatology where I'm also on the Athena Swan Committee and I'm also uh, the co-president of the Women in STEM Society. So I really enjoyed your talk as well, thank you. Um, I think that the thing that really uh, spoke to me was the, the need for the data. Mm -hmm. You know, this data is so important. Uh, part of what we do in our society is policy lobbying and activism. And we go around and we promote some of the policies that we've come up with to try and create a better improvement in Kings for, for everyone. And the problem we always face is that we don't have the data. And they say, oh, we've great policy, but where's your evidence that this is going to do any good? Who wants this policy? So the data is so important because it really helps us enact change and stops us, us as women getting told that you're just a cross woman or, you know. <laughs> so we want that data to really, to really prove it. So I thought that was brilliant what you were doing. Um, and I just want to echo what everyone else has said. The equity is so important. We can't, we can't keep talking about women on their own. We need to talk about the intersectionality of everything that's going on. And we need to try and give starting points that represent that equity rather than equality. We want to make sure that everyone has the equal opportunity at the end. That is an excellent point to open up to questions. Anyone have any questions they would like to put to our panel or somebody else? Yes, John L. Oh, sorry, I think the waiting on the microphone. <laughs> you deserve it. Thanks, guys. So, um, so I'm John L. Um, thank you, first of all, for your talk. I just want to say, in all my years of Kings, this is the first time I've come to an international women's event and somebody's mentioned race. Um, normally you just talk as a woman and then that's it. Like you said, you're a woman one day, you're black the next day. So this has been nice. Um, I wanted to ask a question with a little bit of context on what you said, for example, women who are applying for those bigger grants and are in a very minoritized point of view in that sense. And also on what you said, um, fund me about being, um, about there not being a lot of black women, about black women leave in academia. So for me personally, I don't think I know anybody who's a peer to us who is staying in academia who's black. Um, all of us are leaving for very many different reasons, but all kind of boil down to the same thing. And taking that into account, like we're in a position where the further you get along in your academic career, the worse the racism gets. But I don't know any, I've never met somebody who's a black woman who's more senior than me. Like I've never met somebody within STEM who was more senior than a PhD student who was a black woman. So there's nobody there to tell you that it might get better or this is how you do things. There's no mentors, there's no nothing. So how do you be more honest and transparent about this data? Like, I appreciate that we need to have these conversations and these things need to be made public, but how do you do that while protecting the people that the data is about? Because it's not nice to see. To, quite frankly, the number of 10 I thought was, I thought that was actually quite high. I thought it was going to be a lot lower than that. Because when you look at black female professors, I don't think any of them are in chemistry. I'm a chemist. So how do you talk about that and then make people stay and feel hopeful about what's to come in the future? Does anyone want to take that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, it's also the first time I've seen really clear, you know, data driven, but also, um, if you like, a kind of activist mindset from an academic who is worth the salt and has done this continuously over a period of time. I can assure you 
the way I'm feeling at the moment is that if we had 20 rituals across the board, right? We Don't will start. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? We will start getting somewhere because the real difficulty, you're not the first person, you just haven't happened to be the first from your field saying this. The number of young black women I have met who don't want to stay in academia for these reasons. Uh, it's part of the challenge, but I think if we don't have a systemic way of dealing with the structural issues that, um, that really continue to reinforce those patterns of applying so many times, never getting there, uh, of seeing as not confident enough, you have not simply asked, if we don't have a systemic way of doing that, we can't win. But one way that I know of doing it, because I tried it in my field of international peace and security, find mates that you think are like and you want to solve the problem together, build a network around it, and move together. Because I was at King's, I can tell you that, 30 something years ago, a lone black woman, there was one other, there was a black guy, but, but in a male dominated department, war studies. And it took trying to find myself, finding myself met also outside of King's, building that network, three, four, five, and trying to move together. But also trying to institutionalize something so that those who come after you do not suffer the same fate necessarily. I cannot think of a, I cannot think of an easier way to do it. There is no easy way to do it. But what I can think of is that within the EDI team, within senior leadership, if there were such networks that wanted to start at King's, and one started four years ago now, five years, what Bernardine Ido was doing from dentistry, and that's why you see the uh, early career, the, the BME early career conferences every year. It cannot be one, I think they're going to the fifth year now or so. It cannot be one conference every year. It has to be a network that we support and help thrive within the institution. Having seen this, we need to take this data. We need to maybe have su subsequent meetings and see how to support you. That pipeline will not come out of thin air. We have to help it, but working with you is what I would say. So we have a question now from a remote member of the audience. I'm going to read it out on their behalf. No data is ever shown for other potentially weighty intersectional issues, such as age and xenophobia, the latter not necessarily related to race, but to sounding different or having English as a second or third language. Is there any data on these characteristics? So basically, that I think particularly on nationality, which I think would be the characteristic I would use to address a question about xenophobia, no, I don't think they're recording it, and I'm fairly sure they're not recording data systematically on age either. Um, so in my asking awkward questions of the EPSRC and the UKRI, one of the questions I am consistently asking is about other axes where we would like them to be recording data um, and I can't say I am having any impact but I guess it took me seven years to get one graph so you know give me another <laughs> 20 and I might make some progress um, and I think both of those things are very much worth addressing just a little anecdote as to why so I have by being a damn nuisance, inveigled myself into quite a lot of meetings in the, with various people at EPSRC and UKRI about these issues. And I was having an informal chat about race and nationality and, in fact, the intersection of the two with an EDI professional from one of said organisations. And the comment she made was, oh, well, these foreign people, they don't write very good English and good proposals. And I was like, slightly dumbfounded. Like, you're an EDI professional, and that's what you have to say. Um, because, frankly, A, that's pretty damn offensive. And B, even if it were true, surely you care about the quality of the science, not about whether you have nice adjectives or something. <laughs> So yes, it's a huge problem. No, they aren't, as far as I can tell, doing anything to fix it. But you never know if we keep pushing. Absolutely. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, uh, thank you.
you very much, uh, first of all, to Rachel and then to the whole uh, panel for, for sharing. Uh, I was just thinking if I was trying to get this data uh, back home, if I would, I, I come from Uganda, if I would be able to get it. But I was shocked today, as I was shocked many years ago when I went to do my grad studies, because I thought that this was a problem just at home. Uh, because in class I was the only girl in class and everything and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, you come out here and you find that uh, we are crying the same problem at home and it is still very, very stuck. I mean, uh, she was surprised the numbers were 10. I was surprised that, you know, they were only 10. <laughs> yeah, and so I was just wondering and uh, uh, putting it to you for me in terms of uh, your international engagement and everything. Uh, given the space you already are putting on this issue through uh, Rachel as well, what more can we look at in terms of different partnerships that you have? Mm. Uh, I will speak for Africa, uh, because that's where I'm coming from, mm. so that we can continue to shed uh, more light uh, on such issues. Because I know when I talk at home, people say, well, they, we are poor, we are not going to school, and all these kind of things, and that's why the numbers are low. And those are some of the arguments we get pushed back. Mm. But if I can show that... <laughs> You know, I was in the UK, in London, of all places, and I saw the same numbers. So, yeah, it is more than just the fact that, uh, you know, the social economic issues, and it is something which is a global uh, problem and how we can work together to really uh, cause a change in this kind of numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to say something? <laughs> no, no, I mean, the, the question, uh, thanks for that, Dorothy, and I should say, I don't know whether everyone knows uh, Dorothy, she's visiting us uh, this week from Makerere University, she's the Dean of Engineering, and actually she's probably the first female Dean of Engineering in her university, and we've seen... <laughs> I, 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 and so it, what I want to say is that we're seeing, you know, in trickles, it's happening. But how can we come together with a strategy that is global enough, punchy enough? And I think the starting point will be to, I, I, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, Rachel, but we're thinking on our feet as, as we're having this conversation. Perhaps in terms of the university networks, uh, the Guild, um, Arua, and we can think of Latin America and parts of Asia where we come together you know, uh, to, for, for the basic partnerships, I would say research partnerships, education partnerships, but mm -hmm. that we try to gather data, um, maybe with the leadership of people that have done this. It, it might be one of the conferences, one of the meetings that we take it upon ourselves to even get the right data to start with and then begin to argue for this in the international networks. It is, I agree, it's a global challenge. When I was at the UN, some of this stuff would, I mean, this is also CSW at the moment um, in New York at the UN. The problems are so wicked in their nature, and that's what systemic, what structural problems look like. And we probably need to connect data. Now we know we can get data, um, and we have ways of collecting it, but having the leadership of people that have done this so that we know what questions to ask in the first instance will be a good starting point, and then we take it to our international networks. Arua, I know, are trying to gather data. That's the African Research in Intensive Universities that Makere is, is a part of. They're also trying to collect data, but not on this question in that way, and it will be good. But they have some data about women in leadership in the universities, not the kind of you know, grounded conversations that we're having here, and we need to influence that. Thank you. So another question from our remote audience. Many thanks for this very informative talk. I would like to ask, now that you have collected this data, what are the potential SMART goals that you think could be enacted to improve the funding discrepancy and improve diversity in senior academic positions? So it's me talking about the data, so that may be my question. So if we quantify the problem as there being a disparity between award rates for men and women in large grants, honestly, the grant has to be there not being a disparity in award rates, men and women in large grants. Um, I would love to see that being achieved on a sort of three to five year time scale. I think given it took me seven years to get the data, I might be being slightly over optimistic. Mm. I think the bigger goal is then around 
numbers of applicants versus numbers of awardees mm -hmm. because the so the award rate data is pretty stark but nonetheless numbers of applicants are much much lower and that is about a lot of things it is about institutional gatekeeping it's about institutions not actually being transparent about this kind of decision making and not even record keeping let alone looking mm. at their data um, but it is also about a situation where there are a lot less women and even more so ethnic minority women as we've said at senior levels you know you can't have our 56 available black women professors all having to put in these grant proposals every year to get the numbers up. That actually would be really unhelpful. Um, so there is a bigger problem around the pipeline, which is not just about the funding councils fixing their processes. So I think in terms of smart goals, we have to be holding ourselves to account and raising numbers at every level mm -hmm. and asking ourselves hard questions when we don't. And I live in a world, so my original degree is in engineering and in my engineering year group and indeed in the national picture at that time, engineering was about 15, 16% women at undergraduate level and nationally it remains within a percent or so either way around 15, 16% women at undergraduate level. Now, I'd love to pretend that was only you know, a couple of years ago, but actually I'm quite old. <laughs> um, so that is over 20 years ago now, and we seem to have seen no progress. Mm -hmm. and, and we keep producing very similar initiatives, mm. and they don't seem to do any good. So we need to start like, looking at these things, setting goals, and when we miss them, asking ourselves hard questions mm. around why what we're doing isn't working and whether we ought to do something else. Mm. Hello everyone, thank you very much for the talk. It was really, really um, inspiring and illuminating. My name is Ayo, and um, what I would like to, um, I guess, share is um, I'm an engineer, and um, while I was studying, uh, at least doing my um, research, I had a supervisor who um, was very intentional in the way he, um, I guess, uplifted the uh, girls, because I was the only girl, but there were other girls on like, you know, um, STEM subjects, and he was very intentional in the way that he would put them up for, like for example, if they're writing a paper, or, you know, encourage them to write a paper so that their name is on the paper, and make mm -hmm. sure that that name is on there. So they have a way of putting that, because um, if you don't have any, you know, um, published material or anything like that. There's nothing you can kind of, you know, link to. So he made sure that happened. When he's putting an application, a grant application, he invites them to be part of it so that they kind of, you know, in, um, not just in name, they actively contributing to have the, uh, you know, design that project so that the name goes in with the submission and when it gets funded, they have been awarded something too. So that way they're kind of in that pipeline. I just wanted to know, is this something that can be done? So like, so that we can reduce that sort of two times <laughs> on that graph, mm -hmm. so that the people at the top grab mm -hmm. people around, put them in there, and help them up as well. Mm -hmm. So that once their name is on there, because as we all know, if you don't have any, um, I guess, any background or anything that you can add to the, your experience, something to add, you wouldn't get anywhere, mm. you, you don't have anything to show. So is there a way to make it, I don't know whether it would be made a, a, a law and encouragement that if a, an academic that is a professor is put in, who's got a very good you know, uh, understanding and has a very uh, um, good record of funding, would bring early career researcher on board. Um, they will just, they will help, you know, put the pro proposal together, submit, and once that's funded, that person's got a funded, um, you know, Can you I know, next to them, yes. and take it on.
from there. Yeah. That worked for me. <laughs> and I just thought it's something that we might maybe, because we have to build it somehow. Right. <laughs> and um, I just thought it might be something that we could probably think about or find a way to make it work or Good. find another mm -hmm. way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. So first thing I want to say is I'm so glad that story went the direction yeah. it did. <laughs> because there was so yeah. often when women or black researchers say to me, and I had a supervisor which, and then I hear something which really tears my heart out. So I'm so glad that you have had, at least in that space, a positive experience. That's wonderful. I think the second thing I want to say is there are schemes which actually take up some of those ideas, which I would really like to see go further out into the ecosystem than they do. Yeah. So maybe my favourite example, because of like where I sit in the subject area, is the Royal Academy of Engineering. Okay? So they do, in fact, two really excellent things, one of which speaks directly to that, but I'm going to tell you about both of them, because they're both really cool. Firstly, they do do the, you can only have four people apply to this funding, mm -hmm. which means that there is an institutional gatekeeping step. But then they say, ah, well, you can only have four, unless your fifth one is a mem member of a group minoritized in engineering, and then you can have an extra application. So this is this whole very incentive thing. You get, as long as you have a minoritized person applying, mm. you get an extra roll of the dice. And in their fellowship scheme, their um, Royal Academy of Engineering, like fellowships for people who are kind of transitioning into mm. the permanent academic type roles, they have for engineering about a 30% rate of women getting those fellowships, which compared to the cohort is hugely successful. So having done that, then they thought, what else can we do? And this is where we speak to this question of how people can help. So now when you're applying to quite a lot of their schemes, you can apply to an extra scheme, which is called access mentoring. And you only have mm. access to it if you are somebody who is minoritized in engineering. And then they find you a mentor because we know that women and other minoritized people have problems building networks, getting support, getting sponsorship. They find you a mentor who will sit down with you, talk through the tactics for applying to the scheme, might read your application, give you feedback, and we fill in that gap. Mm -hmm. And that's part of their funding process. It's done by the funder. Mm -hmm. And that's an example of a positive action, something that genuinely breaks down the barriers, which I think is like really a good exemplar for the sector. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to wrap it up here, but there is now. We've got the space for another hour. There's refreshments, and I think most of our panel can stay. So, yeah, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for your excellent questions, and thank you so much to the panel for all of your insights. So, thank, thank you. you.